Good morning, everyone. My name is Cristiani. I'm going to tell you about dissipation in quantum systems. So since it's the first lecture, we start very simple. Let's start with the classical mechanics. Our classical mechanics is based on two formalisms. The first, Hamilton, on which we write that H of P and Q is given by P squared over 2M plus V of Q. It's something very easy to understand because most of the systems that we are treating are conserving their energy. So it is a very natural concept to take something which is the sum of kinetic plus potential energy. Out of this, you have Hamilton equations of motion and uh, Q dot G to the Q, G to the P, and everything is very fine. Okay? So, besides the Hamiltonian formalism, we have also another one, which is the Lagrangian formalism, right? Uh, one, over, uh, one over two M Q dot squared minus V of Q. This is something quite funny. Have you ever stopped to think about it? Sum of energies is a very natural thing. Now you have difference, kinetic minus potential. Isn't it odd? And even more odd is that there is something which is the action, which is, which is now a functional of the trajectory Q of T, which is such that the integral of this in time is a conserved quantity. Pure magics. So beautiful, isn't it? And of course, from here, when you look then at the stability of the action, you will get the Euler-Lagrange Euler equations of motion. which allow you to understand how things evolve in time. Okay, so this is classical mechanics. Then we also have quantum mechanics in the way how everybody knows how to do. So the equivalent, and of course you can go from Hamilton to Lagrange via Lagrangian. Uh, now, when you go into quantum mechanics, the equivalent to the Hamiltonian formalism is just the Schrodinger formalism, right? You go simply by saying, okay, now I promote my Hamiltonian to an operator which is connected to time derivative. My momentum, at my position is also now an operator in my momentum minus i h bar g g t g g x or g g q in p and q formulation and i replace it here h is i h bar g g t again based on conservation of energy equal to p squared minus square plus h uh, i squared minus one h squared second derivative is laplacian p squared over two m plus V of Q operator. And now, because now H equal P squared over 2M plus V is an operator, you apply it in the wave function. And here you have Schrodinger equation. So the canonical quantization is fully based on the fact that energy is conserved, okay? What if instead of using Schrodinger, I would use the quantum mechanical formulation based on the Lagrangian? This is then the Feynman path integral formalism, right? Now, what he will say is that for going from the, the, the postulations that comes here from Feynman is very different from what Schrodinger has been postulating. Instead of postulating these operators, which are now associated to 
differential operators that came inspired from the fact that you were reproducing these things when you would apply them on the wave equation, Feynman comes, and actually it's not Feynman, it was Dirac. Feynman just did the very last step that was missing. This shouldn't be called Feynman path integrals, it should be called Dirac path integrals. So you will now postulate that the propagator to go from a position A to a position B is going to be the path integral, the sum, over all possible trajectories, where now these trajectories are being weighted by the action, the previous beautiful concept that we had here, in unities of h-bar. Okay? So you postulate something else. You say, all trajectories bringing me from A to B are important. And the weight of each trajectory is the action in unities of h-bar. And remember that the action is a functional. For this reason, I put a square bracket, right? And a functional, you remember what it is. Do you know what a functional is? What is the difference of f of g of x and a functional? What's the difference? Sorry? Exactly. So this one, a function of a function, takes each point x, associates to each one, one point g of x, and to each point an f of g of x. This one takes the entire curve and gives you a number. Very good. It's a functional. Okay. So now we have now a completely different formalism. And it is now possible, by doing some expansion, to derive Schrodinger equation starting from this different way, which is now based on the Lagrangian and on the action. Very good. The Feynman path integrals is going to be very useful for us because uh, what we are going to treat here is a many-body system. Okay, but all of them are based on energy conservation everywhere. Everything I know how to do in quantum mechanics is based on energy conservation. What happens if my energy is not conserved? If my system is open and I have dissipation? How to do quantum mechanics of an open system? Okay? That's what these lectures are going to be about. So, first of all, Where do I find open systems in classical mechanics? Let's start with the paradigmatic example, which is Brownian motion. So in the 1800, does everyone know what Brownian motion is? Who knows what Brownian motion is? Okay, few. So, uh, in the 1800, Robert Brown was putting a grain of pollen inside water and following the motion of this grain of pollen with a microscope. And he has seen something like this. So, every time that this particle is meeting one molecule of the fluid, it scatters and it goes all around. It is a symbol for random motion, okay? Many people have been trying to describe this type of problem. And even Einstein himself worked a lot of it. And Brownian motion is well described by something that's called the Langevin equation. And the Langevin equation So, the, the Langevin equation contains several terms. The first one is just mass times acceleration, which is something very well known. The second one is a friction that is proportional to the velocity. 
Then you have the derivative of some external potential. And on the right hand side, you have a fluctuating force. So the fluctuating force We are going to look here at something which has zero average and a delta correlation. So it's simply that the correlation of this force at time t and time t t prime is to eta. Eta is this friction coefficient here. This is the friction coefficient. Okay? Kbt, so the Boltzmann constant times temperature, and this is a white noise, what is called a white noise because the correlations are proportional to a delta function. So simply, mass times acceleration plus eta times velocity is a friction which is proportional to the velocity, plus V prime of Q equal to F of T. This is connected via the fluctuation dissipation theorem. OK, so but now you can try to find any Hamiltonian that could give you this as an equation of motion. You can't, because this term is losing energy. This is a friction that's proportional to the velocity. So what if we would like to do quantum mechanics of a system that obeys this type of equation of motion? But you will tell me, where is this? Where do I find a system that should be described quantum mechanically and that obeys this type of equations of motion? So this type of problem appeared already in the 80s. And in the 80s, they started studying and realizing experimentally Josephson junctions and the squids. So what is, maybe I take another board to get quantum. So, what is a Josephson junction? Before knowing what is a Josephson junction, we need to recall a little bit a superconductor. So you know very well that in a superconductor, you have that, you have an instability of the Fermi surface. And the electrons at the Fermi surface are going to form Cooper pairs with momentum plus k and minus k, so a zero momentum Cooper pair. And these Cooper pairs are now bosons. And because you are transmuting from fermions to bosons, all these Cooper pairs can condense in the lowest energy state. And they are going to form a macroscopic wave function. So in a superconductor, your Cooper pairs are going to condense into a macroscopic wave function psi, which can be written as modulus of psi e to i phi, right? And all the things you have learned in quantum mechanics, like probability current, do you remember? That was proportional to psi grad psi star minus psi star grad, grad psi, which was a completely abstract concept. Now, this thing, you multiply by 2e, which is the charge of your Cooper pairs, and this is a current that you measure. So for a superconductor, quantum mechanics becomes observable at a macroscopic scale, which is super beautiful, right? So what Josephson observed is he said, OK, so I have that all my electrons condense into a gigantic uh, wave function. And this is my superconductor one. And here is another superconductor two. This one has a macroscopic wave function and this one too. But if it is a wave, this means that if these two superconductors are close enough 
of distances of the order of 10 angstroms, Cooper pairs can go from one to the other, and I can get a current without any applied voltage. It's a purely quantum phenomenon because of the tail of this macroscopic wave function, right? So this is then uh, the Josephson current, which can flow without any applied voltage. And now, so uh, this type of system is one of the kind of systems we could describe. But then people use the Josephson junctions to build something which is extremely useful, which is called a squid. And a squid is not what you can eat here in each restaurant, but it stands for superconducting quantum interference device. So it is basically a ring. If you would take a ring which is made of a superconducting material, something very interesting could happen. So take first a ring made of a superconducting material, but in the normal state. And now you put it into a perpendicular magnetic field. So the magnetic field is everywhere. Now you are going to cool down. This is the material, right? Which is here in the ring. You make this material superconductor. Immediately, the flux, which is going to be the flux will be expelled from the superconducting ring, right? Because it, it's the property of the superconductor, it's a Meissner effect. It expels the flux and it will do it in a way that the flux inside the ring is going to be quantized in units of the flux quantum. So you get flux quantization inside the ring. And the flux is there and cannot escape. So suppose now I cut out this B, the flux stays there, it cannot escape. But suppose that I would like to detect a magnetic flux. And this is the tiniest magnetic flux that I should be able to detect. Can I build a device in which I could count this flux quanta? And indeed, you can. And the only thing you need to do, you need to interrupt this ring by an insulator, by a metal, by anything else that is non-superconducting. Let's say an insulator. And what you are building here is a Josephson junction. Okay? When you do this, you are opening a door for the flux to pass. It cannot cross the superconductor but it can cross this door. And it's a very tiny door, such that every time that one goes through, you will see a current circulating in your system and you will be able to detect the tiniest magnetic flux. Okay? So, squids are super important. Do you remember when the CERN got shut down for more than a year? It's because the squids blew up. They operate at very low temperatures, and uh, you need to cool them all the time. And they had a problem in the cooling system, and the squids blew up, and they needed more than a year and lots of money to put the squids in place again. You can use these squids to measure um, a magnetocardiogram. It's very interesting because if you do an electric measurement of your heart, an electrocardiogram. It can be that you are going to die from a heart attack tomorrow and you will not see it. But if you do a magnetocardiogram, which is based on squids, you would know it. There are very few ones in the world. Those are very big machines, but they are extremely precise. Okay? It's a very important tool that we can use to measure the tiniest magnetic fields, which are one flux quantum. So, it turns out that the Josephson junction can be written as a capacitor in parallel with a nonlinear element in parallel with a resistor. 
you have an equivalent description of the Josephson junction with an RLC circuit, okay? And it's possible to show that the total flux phi inside this squid obeys an equation of motion, which is C phi two dots plus one over R phi dot plus V prime of phi equal to I of T, where I of T average is zero and the correlation is a white noise. So now, instead of the mass of the particle, I have the capacitance of the junction. You can think of it as two parallel plates, which will have a capacitance. This R is the resistance. Usually, they shunt the system with a resistance in a way that they can control the value of R, which is much larger than the, the natural resistance of the system. V prime of phi is a potential that you can prepare the way you want to study the kind of problems you want. And this is a fluctuating current. So usually this thing operates in the regime where you have a bias current. And when a flux passes by, you see a fluctuating current going through your circuit. Okay? So I forgot to say one thing here. This equation holds in the limit when the mass of your particle is much larger than the mass of the fluid in which it is embedded, and that the, the, you are looking at the system at times t much larger than the average collision time. Okay? So this is some effective description, and this is mass of the fluid of the molecules in the fluid. Okay. So, and then in the 80s, people like Michel Devoré, John Martini, that maybe you know from the Google, building the, the quantum computer, they started studying and building this type of systems. And for this type of systems, they could operate them at temperatures of order of one Kelvin. And at temperatures of one Kelvin, they would see quantum effects. So you are seeing quantum effects in a system which is described by a Langevin equation in the classical limit. And the question was how to do quantum mechanics for this system. Is it clear, the motivation, why we should learn that? Do you have any question until now? Yes, please, Andrea. Yes. I understand that uh, there is this uh, water molecule that is a bit of heat to the solvent, okay? And uh, so, more or less, I figure out what the quantum medium of different terms is uh, potential. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Because, uh, I can see the, uh, the effect of the quantum The force, yes, the yes. Exactly. And there, the analogy there. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is the current. Actually, if uh, and I have it on the script. If you have never seen that before, I could give to you to study in the afternoon. Actually, so when you put a current here, it can pass through all the elements. You have three types of currents, right? You have currents passing here, passing through the nonlinear elements, and also real electrons which are passing by and causing some resistance in the material. So you have also the, the friction is coming from here. The current is running in parallel. You would pass the current here, and it has several trajectories to go through via the nonlinear one. You have a, a, a motion of Cooper pairs, but you also have normal electrons that are passing and causing the dissipation. Yes, exactly. And this is from that part. 
yeah, so the current is fluctuating. So you will get this fluctuating current. When the fluxes pass by here, you see a current circulating because you are varying the flux. And if you vary the magnetic field, you get a current. You measure, the, you measure the current, yes. You measure the fluctuating current. That's precise. So suppose you have a five phi naught, okay? Now, one phi naught comes through here, and when one phi naught comes through, now you have n minus one phi naught inside. When it goes through a circulating, you measure current across the device. Yeah, so the I here, this is a bias current. When you will write the, the, for instance, here in the V prime, here, you get, you get the Josephson energy, Ej, one minus cosine, and if you have a bias, this is a cosine phi term. I can draw up here for you. This is a cosine phi term, okay? And now when you bias, you get a current here, which is your bias, this becomes a washboard potential, okay? And now every time when one flux goes through, you decay from here to here. So basically there is a relation connecting your phi in units of phi zero and your phase of your Joseph, the phase difference, because now, you will get a phase difference here. If this is phi one and this is phi two, you will define a phase phi, which is the difference between the two. And every time when this phase difference changes by two pi, you get an integer, okay? So the flux in the interior of your squid in units of phi naught, flux is just magnetic field times area, is connected to the phase difference of the Josephson junction in units of two pi by an integer, okay? And when you slide from here to here, you will do it by quantum tunneling, you could also do by thermal activation, your phase of the Josephson junction changes by two pi, you go from one minimum of cosine to the next, and the flux quantum inside changes by phi naught. And at this moment, when this flux passes by, you measure this current. This is the fluctuating current, IF, maybe I should call it IF. Yes. Yes. The current is connected to the friction via fluctuation dissipation theorem. So somehow we right? Have no problem which has, uh, uh, let's say, two variables, which is uh, the current and the flux, we decide that the current, uh, that the dynamic of the current is kind of uh, effective, and we are left in a question of the only flux. So, via via the kicks, yes, 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 yes. So, th this is precisely the fluctuation here is connected to the dissipation, right? So, every kick will be described effectively as acting into the, the correlation of your fluctuating force, and there it's the same. It's precisely analogous in that way. Yes, well, the flux acts like a generalized coordinate which is obeying Brownian motion, <coughs> yes. And this holds for the squid, but holds also for a Josephson junction, if you want. And besides this type of squid that I have been drawing for you, which is the so-called RF squid, you could also have what is called a DC squid, in which instead of one, you would have two Josephson junctions. And for the DC squid, 
it's what people usually use in any device because a DC squid has lower noise. And what is very interesting is if you have two degrees of freedom, you can describe them in terms of sums and differences, right? When you are describing in terms of a center of mass and they are acting as the same, you would get the same as a single Josephson junction. But they can act elastically, which means you could let one flux in and not yet one flux out. So they two could behave independently. And then you get more means to manipulate your system. Okay, this would be then the, the DC squid. But let's stay with the RF because it makes our life easier to just understand now the model. More questions? Yes, please. Why is there because the, the, yeah, that's from the way how they do the shunt resistance. So the, the system itself has already a resistance, but you don't know. So what they do, they put another one in parallel to be able to control and manipulate. And they put a resistance uh, which is a very large. The system is called resistively shunted junction, like this. I can write for you. Resistively, maybe here. It's called resistively. It's operational. It's just to have more control. Shunted junction. And then you know precisely the value of R and you can control it. And because you are putting it in parallel, it appears in the denominator. Okay, I could give you also tomorrow one exercise and I will give you a script in any case with more descriptions about that. You can derive parts of it if you want. Okay, are we fine? So now we can then start with the model itself. So the model that we are going to learn about is the so-called Caldera Leggett model. So Leggett, you probably know, he got the Nobel Prize for explaining liquid helium. And Caldera was one of his very successful PhD students. He didn't have many that were very <laughs> successful. He was a very tough supervisor. Uh, and during his PhD, he developed what is nowadays known as the Caldera Leggett model. Okay, so if you have a system that is an open system, it's losing energy to the environment. You only know how to do quantum mechanics for closed systems. What should you do? What would be our first trial? <laughs> so you have a system, and you could think of a reservoir for which the system is losing energy. But if I would take system plus reservoir, the system is closed, right? So that's what they thought. They did a system plus reservoir approach. Okay, so my, let's write uh, Lagrangians for the system. Let me see if I am here. No, or we could also write a Hamiltonian for my system. So, I will have a Hamiltonian for my system. I have a Hamiltonian for the reservoir. And I should have a Hamiltonian for the interaction between the system and the reservoir. So, I have to choose a reservoir. I could assume that my reservoir is in thermal equilibrium. Makes sense, right? Let's assume first 
that this reservoir is in thermal equilibrium by itself. Forget about the particle, forget about the system. So I have a reservoir in thermal equilibrium. Something which is in thermal equilibrium, how can I describe it as what? I have many degrees of freedom which are in thermal equilibrium. And now I would disturb it slightly from equilibrium when I couple to the particle. How could I describe something in equilibrium? As harmonic oscillators. I used to hear from my teachers that there is only one thing we know how to solve, harmonic oscillators. So you better convert the entire world into them because then you are in business. Gaussian integrals, you know how to integrate, everything is fine, right? But it's a very reasonable assumption. They are in thermal equilibrium. You have many, many, many degrees of freedom. The interaction will slightly perturb them away from the minimum, but I can describe my entire bath, be it fermionic or bosonic, as harmonic oscillators. Even an electronic bath at equilibrium could be described as harmonic oscillators. Okay, so they are very smart. That's what they did. So, they are going then to write that, uh, I was writing here, my Hamiltonian of the system. The reservoir is going to be mapped as a bath of harmonic oscillators, which is very nice and very easy. And now I will get then an information for the entire system. But I don't want the information for the entire system. I want the information only for my system of interest, which is this. So I have to find a way to trace out the reservoir degrees of freedom and get an effective description of the way how they are acting on the system of interest. Okay? So for this, we are going to compute. I'm just giving you now the a guideline of what we are going to do in the next lectures. The density operator of the composite system and I want to calculate my density operator rho of t because it is governing the evolution of my a t over h bar rho of zero, h y, a t t over h bar, okay? So it is governing the evolution of my rho zero. And now, if I try to measure any operator, any observable, let's call operators or observables referring only to the system, So I will call this an observable, which is a function of P and Q, okay? So I know that the average value of any observable is going to be the trace over the reservoir and the system of the density operator times the observable. So if I have the row, the matrix row, I can calculate the average value of any observable, position, velocity, whatever. But now, if O only depends on the system of interest, this means that I can rewrite this as trace of the system of trace over the reservoir of my row of T, times the observable. And this is now defined as my reduce the density operator rho twiddle of T. Okay? So this is simply the trace over S of my rho twiddle of T times the observable. So the quantity that we want to calculate is this rho twiddle. We'll write the density operator for system plus reservoir. We'll trace out the large n number of degrees of freedom of the harmonic oscillators, and we'll derive a reduced density operator rho twiddle. 
And with this, I am now able to calculate the average value of any observable. So this is one thing that I know. And the other thing that I know while writing this model is that I want the model to reproduce the Langevin equation in the semi-classical limit, because I know how it behaves in the classical limit. So I have to build a model such that, so I have to choose H reservoir and interaction such that it, uh, it reproduces, so the equations of motion for the system, it reproduces Langevin equation in the semi-classical limit. Okay, so that's then what we are going to do. One important thing, we are going to assume that each degree of freedom, so while you have a particle coupled to an enormous number N of harmonic oscillators. There is a large number N of harmonic oscillators which are coupled to my particle of interest that is here. Okay? Maybe I should have put it in pink. So, each degree of freedom is only weakly coupled to my particle. But I can nevertheless describe strong friction because I have a large number of degrees of freedom. Even if each of them is weakly coupled, I can describe strong friction because I have many. Okay? Very good. Uh, so let's then write now the action, the Lagrangian, sorry. Let's write the Lagrangian for our total system. So L is Ls plus Li plus Lr. So Ls is very simple, one half of mq dot square minus V of q. Let's call it V naught. Now, my interaction. I have to couple these two things, which could be the simplest possible type of interaction that you could imagine between your particle and your harmonic oscillators. The simplest one they thought is coordinate of the particle coupled to coordinate of the harmonic oscillators. Okay? So I have a particle. I should have been writing this with a capital M to distinguish it better. I have a particle with capital M mass coupled to MK harmonic oscillators, which have frequency omega K and coordinates QK. And I have an large any number of them, okay? So the way they thought, yes, let's couple them via coordinate, coordinate. So the interaction Lagrangian is written as minus CK, Q, QK. So there is a spring constant here that depends on each oscillator and I couple the coordinate of the particle to the coordinate of the harmonic oscillator. We will uh, check further for variations on that. And then I have the Lagrangian of my reservoir, which is simply summing k, one half of mk qk dot squared, minus one half of mk omega k squared qk squared. Super simple, isn't it? And still they became so famous with it. 
Very good. Now, it comes the first question and the exercises that you are going to do this afternoon. I want to prove that with this Lagrangian, I can reproduce Langevin equation in its full glory, as we had written there before. Okay? So, for this, you will get some guided exercises. And let me just tell you again a few steps on what you are going to do there to show that. I can go seven minutes further. So, first of all, you will write the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for Q. So, you have coordinates Q and coordinates QK, right? So, you do Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for Q and Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for QK. You will get two equations and they are coupled. So, you will start very easily and you will get simply that m q two dots will be equal to minus v prime zero of q minus summing k c k q k. That's the equation for q, which is coupled to q k, and then you get the other one, m k q k double dot is equal to minus m k omega k squared q k minus ck q. Let's call these equations 5 and 6 in my script. So you get the two equations of motion just doing Euler Lagrange, but please do it. Okay, now you have to do Laplace transforms. you will do a Laplace transform for QK. And you will get an expression for QK twiddle of S, which is the Laplace transform of QK of T. Okay? And then you will take the inverse, you will replace this, You do Laplace transform, you will get the, the, the QK. You will replace the inverse in the equation 5. Replace inverse transform in 5. And you will show that you obtain something of this kind mq2 dots plus uh, v prime of q will be equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral from epsilon minus i infinity to epsilon plus i infinity of summing k ck qk dot at 0 over s squared plus omega k squared plus S Q K of zero. Those are the initial conditions for the harmonic oscillators. S squared plus omega K squared. All this E to S T G S. Oops. S T G S, yes. And you still have here plus some in K ck squared over mk 1 over 2 pi i integral. This equation is not in the script for the exercise. That's why I'm writing it, to give you an intermediate step while you are calculating. s squared plus omega k squared e to s t g s. OK? So. You do Laplace transform, you replace everything there, you will come to this equation, and now it's what you have to start analyzing. Uh, 
Okay. Now, there will be an identity that you can use that I have given to you in the, in the exercise script. And now you can rewrite. You will get the following. Uh, you will use this identity when you transform everything, and you will see that you'll be able to rewrite this equation, let me call it seven. You will be able to rewrite this equation in the following way, mq2 dots plus v0 prime of q minus summing k ck squared mk omega k squared 1 over 2 pi i q tilde of s e to s tgs and this is actually q of t plus This is again this is going to be equal to minus one over two pi i integral summing k c k q k dot of zero over s squared plus omega k squared plus s q k of z oops q k of zero s squared plus omega k squared e to s t g s okay you will get that good so it is already looking like Langevin equation right at least for the first two terms now we have to work out a little bit the next ones. So this term here, it looks like minus ck squared over mk omega k squared times q. Looks like a derivative of something that is like this. Looks like some renormalization of a potential that reads delta v that would be minus one half summing k ck squared over mk omega k squared q squared because the derivative of this would give me precisely this term, ck squared, mk omega k squared times q. When I take the derivative of this with respect to q, the factor two cancels. So if I look at this term, the potential to which the particle was subjected has been renormalized due to the coupling to the bath of harmonic oscillators. Okay? So this term is known as a renormalization of the potential, usually they add by hand a counter term that cancels this one. This counter term appears depending on the type of interaction that you put. If you couple the system via coordinate, coordinate, you will get a counter term. If I would couple the system via coordinate velocity, there would be no counter term. The counter term depends and the renormalization of the potential depends on the kind of problem that I'm treating. I can be treating problems where the system does not renormalize by coupling to the reservoir. Most of the time it does. 
Okay? So this is a subtlety that will depend on what you are studying, that you need to have this renormalization or not. If you look at a, one electron interacting with its own radiation damping, for instance, you don't get it. But for most of the cases, you do. Okay, so this little part here I can already put as a renormalization of the potential. I get now these other two terms to be able to get my fluctuating force and my friction. One of them has to give me the friction and the other one has to give me the fluctuation, fluctuating force, right? Okay, very good. So now, this last term on the left-hand side, this one here in the middle, look, I have an S squared over S squared plus omega K squared. If I would have only S, I would have, this is the, the Laplace transform of cosine, but I have S squared. So it's good to write this S squared as a derivative in time of E to S T. So I can replace this, this part, as being like, oh, sorry. Okay, now, the third term, left-hand side, third term. The third term, I can write is it as DGT, I will very soon give you a break, okay? Of summing k, ck squared over mk omega k squared, 1 over 2 pi i, integral of s, q twiddle of s, e to s t gs, over s squared plus omega k squared. So I transformed the S squared with a DGT because the only place where I have time is there. And this is very good because now this one, for this one, I can use the convolution theorem, which is explicitly written in the exercise. I gave, did I give you? Yes, no, I didn't. I didn't give you the convolution theorem? No, okay, then I give. Okay, then you will use a convolution theorem that the inverse Laplace transform of F1 of S times F2 of S will give you the integral from 0 to T, F1 of T minus tau, or T minus Z. This is my F2 of Z, dz. You can use this convolution. You will remember that your F1 of t is cosine of omega kt. And then F1 s, which is s over s squared plus omega k squared can be written as, mm, I'm running out of, running out of places. Oh, two more minutes, just, just write this and then I give you a break. So this can then be written as DDT of summing k, ck squared over mk, omega k squared, integral of 0 to t, cosine of omega k, t minus t prime, q of t prime, dt prime. Okay? And now I will stop because I will need to after that, introducing and a very important concept, and I want you very alert after the coffee. Okay, just before you go, what did we do? Two minutes revision. We started from a system that is dissipating, like Brownian motion described by Langevin equation. I told you that we have an example where this type of physics can be seen at very low temperatures, 
to be able to understand whether you could see quantum effects in a dissipative system, we need to do a model for that. We coupled our system of interest, which is a particle of mass n, to a reservoir of n harmonic oscillators. We wrote the closed Lagrangian for the total system. And now our first task is to check, can this model reproduce the Langevin equation in the semi-classical limit? We wrote Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, and we are playing by applying Laplace transforms to see whether the final equation, which is written there, can be now written as a Langevin. Okay, and which are going to be the assumptions in the middle that we have to do. Because we had two equations of motion, one for the particle, one for the, the oscillators, which we had to replace on each other. So we already got a renormalization of the potential, and now we are getting playing with the second term on the left-hand side, and we stopped here. So we need to go on with this one after the break and with this one underneath to reproduce Langevin equation. Okay? So we should do a 10 minutes break or how long? 10 minutes break? Good. Is there coffee? Good. Okay. Do you hear me well? Okay, so let's restart. I had some very good questions, but you just ask here privately, and your colleagues don't get the occasion to enjoy your very good questions. So, for instance, now I just had someone asking, I don't understand this interaction term, Q, Q, K. If it's something harmonic, I would have expected Q minus Q, K squared. Right? There are others saying the same. Yes. So, but Q minus Q, K squared would give me Q squared, which is renormalizing the potential V naught. Q, K squared, which is renormalizing the potential of the harmonic oscillator. And the important part that remains is Q, Q, K. Okay? Please, if you have questions, ask it loud, because it's very useful to help your colleagues also, because sometimes everyone has the same question. I think we had also more questions, but I already forgot. It was before the coffee. So don't hesitate to ask. It is always very useful. Okay, very good. So we had stopped. We had that expression that we want to show that it reproduces the Langevin equation. And we were looking at the middle part, and we could rewrite it like this. Okay? So now, I want to uh, manipulate this further, but I have here something which is a discrete sum in K, and I would like to write this in the continuum, because we are starting the model with all the microscopic variables of these harmonic oscillators, like coupling constant CK, mass MK, frequency omega K, but that's something I cannot know, I cannot measure. So I must make a step that allows me to go from this microscopic description of my reservoir into a macroscopic description in terms also of continuum frequencies. And this, what allows me to do that, is something very important. So to transform sum in K into an, uh, an integral in frequencies, we need to define the so-called spectral function of the bath. So this is a definition. My J of omega is defined as by summing k of ck squared over 2 mk omega k delta of omega 
my nose is on my back. Okay. So it's a continuous function, which is going to peak every time when the frequency is equal to the harmonic oscillator peak. And this is the weight of this delta function. Okay? Okay. So if I have this uh, spectral function, I can replace, now you see what I have here, ck squared over mk omega k squared. I can replace this thing there, and I can rewrite that. Summing k of ck squared over mk omega k squared cosine of omega k t minus t prime. This is 2 over pi integral in frequencies j of omega over omega cosine of omega t minus t prime. OK? Because if I replace my j of omega here, I cut the pi, I cut the 2, I get ck squared over mk. There is omega k, but there is another omega here because there is a delta function. So the only thing that remains will be the sum in omega k's, which is precisely what I had before. Very good. So. Actually, this j of omega, this spectral function of the bath, and this is an exercise, uh, let me see if it is today. Yes, it is uh, in your exercise. You will show that this j of omega is nothing but the imaginary part of the Fourier transform of minus i theta of t minus t prime, this is a theta function, of the average value of the commutator of ck qk of t ck qk of t prime. OK? So it's the imaginary part of the Fourier transform of the retarded part of the correlation between the CK, QK, at T, and at T prime. That is also one of the exercises that you are going to do. And now it comes the biggest assumption. You are coming from a function like this, which has all these microscopic parameters, and now they make the big step in the assumptions of the model, they say, let's assume that j of omega, this is an assumption. They are assuming this to be eta omega for frequencies smaller than a cutoff and zero otherwise. They assume that the response of the bath, so their j of omega as a function of omega, is assumed to be a linear function scaling with omega linearly up to a cutoff frequency, and above this, it is zero. OK, that you can only excite your bath up to some cutoff frequency is quite reasonable, right? Like which should be in a solid, the maximal frequency that I should be able to excite, the Debye frequency, probably, right? If the frequency is too high, I can't excite anymore. But they are making this assumption that this bath is going to be excited. It's zero at the beginning, and you start exciting it linearly, OK? This assumption of this linearity here is what afterwards is going to reflect 
in the fact that we are getting the Langevin equation. This eta to the omega power one is responsible for the first derivative, q dot, is the DGT, first derivative of q, in the Langevin equation. Okay? It is called ohmic damping. So the, the damping is called ohmic, which means linearly in the frequency. It does not need to be. And one of the things that we are investigating in my group at the moment is when this damping is no ohmic. Okay? So this means if this is some omega to any free to any power s, the derivative that I would get in the Langevin equation is not first derivative, but it is s derivative, where s could be a fraction, could be non integer. So then we will be dealing with fractional calculus and fractional stochastic systems. So one of the works done in my group a few years ago, it was to solve the fractional Langevin equation, and we found out a novel state of matter, which was a time glass. There is a periodicity that emerges in the system and looks like a glass, but oscillating in time. I hope I get time to tell you a little bit about it in the last lecture, because probably many of you are not familiar with fractional calculus. Fractional calculus is something fascinating that started with L'Hopital. And all the big mathematicians have putting, been putting their hands, Riemann, Liouville, Weil, Caputo, etc. Everyone has a different one. <laughs> And physicists took a while until we could start uh, touching them because we can only start with initial conditions that are integer. We can't start with fractional initial conditions. We don't know what they are. So it took until the 60s with Caputo to be able to use fractional derivatives in physics problems. But I hope to, is to give you a taste about that, okay? But most of the time, the systems are omic. And the problem is that even when they are not, people think that they are. Another problem that we solved recently is in magnetism, the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, which is also a dissipative equation describing the dynamics of the, the spin in several uh, magnetic systems, everybody assumes it to be omic but you could also have a fractional uh, 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 damping term, Gilbert damping. We also derived recently, last year, we have a paper on that, on a fractional Gilbert damping, and an experiment. The experimentalists could measure the magnetic resonance to decide whether the damping is linear or nonlinear with any fractional component. So, because people just by default, everybody assumes that everything is linear, but it does not need to be. And it's good to be aware of that. Okay? So, very good. Let me see where I was. Yeah. So, for the moment, if we assume this ohmic damping, and this capital omega is much larger than the typical frequencies in our system, it's some cutoff frequency, so then we are able to rewrite that thing here, this term here. We can rewrite it as 2 over pi integral of eta cosine of omega t minus 2 prime d omega. Right? Because this is now just eta omega. The omega cuts with this one. It remains just the eta times the cosine. And now I can rewrite the delta function, delta n of x, as sine of any x divided by pi x in the limit and the limit for n going to infinity 
of delta n of x does not exist, but the integral, the limit for n going to infinity of the integral of delta n of x times a function of x dx gives me this function at zero. So I will integrate this cosine, I will get a sine, sine of omega, where this omega is my n here, which is going to infinity because my cutoff frequency is very large. I rewrite this as a sine. Using this definition, I am able to integrate this delta function coming from here. And finally, I can show that this can be written as eta q dot of t. Oh, not this, wait, I'm missing the other part. Uh, sorry, sorry, not this. I can show that, let me write it down there. So this gives me the eta delta function, but I have to put everything together. I will show that ddt, that's the term which is over there, uh, here, this one. DGT, this part gives me the delta function times the q of the integral from 0 to t to eta delta q of t prime, dt prime, this is going to be written as eta q dot of t. So that middle term over there, which was written here, is giving me now the friction term. It remains the last one on the right-hand side, which is this part here, which depends on the initial conditions, right? Give me one second to... to finish my coffee. Okay, so now the last part is just this term here now that we'll be looking at. So on the right-hand side of that equation, now I can interpret this as the fluctuating force. You see that it depends on the initial conditions at zero. I can. I suppose that the bath is in thermal equilibrium. Then I will have that the average value of the position and the average value of the velocities of each harmonic oscillator in the bath is equal to zero. And also that position and velocity are uncorrelated. Q dot K of zero, Q K of zero is zero, right? The initial velocity is zero, the initial position of each oscillator is zero and velocity and position are uncorrelated. In addition, they are in equilibrium. So I should assume equipartition of energy. So if I look at qk dot of zero, qk prime dot of zero, over mk delta of kk prime. So mk qk dot squared divided by two, kinetic energy, right? This has to be KBT divided by two. So half of the thermal energy goes into kinetic and half goes into potential. So MK velocity squared divided by two equal to KBT divided by two for K equal to K prime. That's the velocity correlator. And the position correlator, QK zero, QK prime zero is KBT divided by MK omega K squared delta of KK prime. 
So the potential energy, one half of mk omega k squared qk squared gives me kbt divided by two. So I am just dividing half of the thermal energy to the potential and half to the velocity, to the kinetic term, right? And when I do this, now I get that. Let me erase that one. I am playing with this very last term, right? When I do this, look, the average value of the first term is zero, of the second term is zero, because average value of QK is zero, and of QK dot is zero. Now you look at the correlation. The cross terms are zero, because QK zero, QK dot zero, average is zero. And now you look at the correlator, this with itself, this with itself, and you use the equipartition here, and you will find marvelously that you can now rewrite this as a fluctuating force, such that this average is zero, and the correlation is going to be two eta kbt delta. Okay? You will just multiply this by itself, look at the correlations, use the equipartition theorem, and you will show that this part is the fluctuating force with a zero average and white noise. Okay? Very good. Questions until here? There was some zoom zoom there. Maybe someone has a question. Clarified already? Is everything clear? So you'll be able to play with the equations in the afternoon and derive everything. Uh, is there any of you who needs uh, grades for the, this course? Who is obliged to give me some exercises for getting the grades? Because sometimes it happens. I just wanted to know whether there is anyone. No? Nobody needs this to be validated as a course that you are taking officially? Okay, good. So then you can just solve it for fun. Okay, so let me now, before finishing the course, go back to the issue of the renormalization of the potential. So, suppose that we could have started with a Lagrangian of interaction, which could be sit with OK, summing K, Q, Q, K dot. No longer coordinate, coordinate, but coordinate velocity instead of the coordinate, coordinate. Okay? So now, when you will write the Lagrangian for the part concerning the interaction, your P is GL GQ dot, you will get an MQ dot, and the PK is going to be GL GQK dot, which is MK omega K QK dot minus CK Tweedle Q. So when you will write your Hamiltonian, which is PQ dot plus PK Q dot K minus Lagrangian, you will get P squared over 2M plus V naught of Q plus summing k of pk plus 
c triple k q squared over 2 m k plus 1 half of m k omega k squared q k squared. So you are shifting your pk by this term. If you now if you now do the canonical transformation where your P goes into P, Q goes into Q. Pk goes into minus mk omega k qk, and qk goes into pk over mk omega k, and you define that your ck is c with ok omega k. You can rewrite a new Hamiltonian, which is going to be p squared over 2m plus v naught plus sum in k ck q q k plus sum in k ck squared over 2m k omega k squared q squared plus sum in k so if we now start with a coordinate velocity interaction and i get now into my hamiltonian out of the lagrangian I see that I get a shift here in this PKs. I apply this canonical transformation. I can rewrite my Hamiltonian in this way. And you see that here, this term appeared. This term that I was getting before, it's negative for the renormalization of the potential. Okay? So for this model, you get this counter term appearing here naturally out of the, the, this type of, the, uh, of coupling. So this Hamiltonian is the same as the previous one. If I add a renormalization of the potential, which is minus 1 half, sum in k, ck squared, over m k, omega k squared, q squared. OK? So. In any case, when you are detecting your system, what you will see is the renormalized potential. The only point is that you will have to choose carefully what kind of coupling you have which renormalizes the potential or not, depending on the problem that you are going to solve. Most of the time uh, in the Caldera and Leggett formalism, they start with the counter term in the Hamiltonian from the very beginning to just cancel out this potential that is just renormalizing V0, because this gives you then a full V, which is V0 plus this renormalized term. OK? But that's the only point that needs to be taken with more attention. OK. Um, I think that's until where I wanted to go. For the next lesson, I will be heavily relying on path integrals. So we have a system which has any plus one degrees of freedom. I have my system of interest and n harmonic oscillators. So the easiest way I can solve that is by using path integrals. For my n plus one uh, particles, I will be writing propagators for the complete system. Then with the nice uh, condition that I have 
Gaussians because my system co is composed of harmonic oscillators, I can exactly integrate out my bath degrees of freedom to see the influence of the bath on the particle, okay? We are going to separate the system into many steps to evaluate what is called the influence functional, which contains all the many uh, uh, path integrals of the bath on the system, and then to obtain this reduced density operator. Next, uh, tomorrow, we will do this uh, at real times. We will obtain the dynamical uh, reduced density operator. I will sketch, I can't do all the calculations, but I have a script for you. I will distribute a script. I will sketch all the, the, the calculations. And then in the last day, I will first do the reduced density operator in equilibrium, because you know this beauty that we have, that we know how to calculate a propagator from A to B in real time. And now we do these magics, which is a Vicky rotation. T is minus I tau. And this is now related to the inverse of temperature. And suddenly, my action in the Euclidean space is describing a system in equilibrium. And now my propagator is going to become my uh, influence, uh, my, my function now for my thermodynamic functional from which I can derive any thermodynamic property, right? So uh, we are going to do also this uh, in Euclidean time because that's the term which is known as calderon leggett action. So the, the term that will uh, be translated into the action to describe the dissipation. And after that, I want to use the last hour maybe with the slides to tell you about this recent work that we had for the friction, which is a fractional friction, a fractional derivative. It is an important case to describe non-Markovian systems. And uh, so if you are someone, there are many who are working nowadays on, for instance, non-Hermitian topological systems. Is there anyone here working on non-Hermitian topological systems? Yes. Yeah, so most of the time, uh, if you use Lindbladian, you can only describe Markovian systems. And this formalism allows you to describe also non-Markovian systems. So it allows you to go beyond the usual description. And then I tell you a little bit about uh, our time glass. And tomorrow, I tomorrow afternoon, after the exercises, I will tell you a little bit about uh, fractals. I am very much uh, interested in fractals because I work on topological insulators and we know how to classify topology for integers, right? For integer dimensions. For, system, for people working on topological insulators, especially for the non-interacting case, if you know the symmetries and you know the dimension, you know everything. You can classify all your topology. And the topology is different if your system is one-dimensional or two-dimensional. So one of the very important questions that I am concerned with is what happens in between? How do I go from one to 2G? Does it change immediately? Uh, if I am at 1.5, is it the same as two? Is it the same as one or is it completely different? And how does it change? So we know very little about fractional dimensions. We, it's not a very much studied topic. And I have been very interested on that. So systems which exhibit fractal dimensions or fraction, no integer dimensions are fractals. So together with experimentalists, we have been building quantum fractals uh, with electrons, with light, in real materials, which are topological and so on. And I could give you a motivation about that in the seminar tomorrow. It's a, an easy seminar with lots of images and lots of experiments and a connecting theory, very different from the heavily equations lectures that I am giving in the morning. Okay, it's for entertainment. Okay, very good. Uh, 
Are there questions? No? Yes, please, Diego. Yes. 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 A field. Yes, yes. This is what I did for my PhD many years ago. Okay, so until now I have a particle which depends on time, and we are going to do the Calderon legate for a particle, right? But you could do it also for a field. For instance, how it is? This is actually a very good question. Thanks for it. How is it if you have a high temperature superconductor? And a high temperature superconductor is a type 2 superconductor, which means in the phase diagram, temperature versus magnetic field, you have not only a Meissner phase in which the flux is completely excluded from your system, but uh, above a certain critical field B, B1, you will have an Abrikozov phase. And in this Abrikozov phase, it's no longer uh, possible for the super electrons which are running around your material to screen the magnetic field which is trying to enter. And it will then let some magnetic field enter in the material in the way of vortices. Okay? It lets, so it is running, 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 and preventing them from entering. Then the field is too big, above the HC1 of T. And when the field is too big, it will let something come in. And what it let come in is precisely one phi naught. It's one flux tube, and now the super electrons will be running around here to screen it, to not let it damage the superconducting material too much. Because a region where you have a magnetic field, it is a normal region. Inside the vortex, the superconducting order parameter, which is psi infinity outside, will go to zero inside the vortex core, right? And the vortex has also a factor potential, that is a penetration depth. This is your coherence length psi, and this is your penetration depth lambda, the, the length on which the supercurrents are running around to screen this flux quantum. And then at this point, the first flux quantum gets in, and then more and more comes in. And because they interact, they form a lattice, usually a triangular lattice, but it can also be uh, uh, a square lattice in some cases. So between HC1 and HC2, vortices are penetrating the material and forming the Shubinikov de Haas phase or Abrikozov phase. But these vortices are elastic objects. So they will get pinned by impurities which are there, and they are now a field which depends on the x coordinate and on time. Okay? And if you now study this vortex flux, this vortex line, you will see you can measure it. You have a, 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 a moment when this uh, flux will all flow in the flux flow regime. You can see that the friction is linear like the, the linear coupling of the caldena legate model. And they are then described by an equation like the caldena legate model, but for a field. So now everything becomes a function of x and t. And you could also have the case if you have many of them in a plane, if you apply these high TC materials, they are composed of planes of copper and oxygen. And in between, you have the charge reservoirs. If you now apply a magnetic field in this direction, you will have the flux lines all here in this plane, and they could also act as a membrane, as an elastic two-dimensional membrane. 
And then if you now apply a, a, a current in the transverse direction, you will get a Lorentz force in between, and you will have the, the tunneling of an elastic two-dimensional membrane, which is a function of x, y, and t, moving between one plane to the next plane. And then you would get dynamics of fields. It gets slightly more complicated, but simply in that equations of motion, in addition to the kinetic term, you get an elastic derivative with respect to x, which is also quadratic. And then you can describe, or in two dimensions, something like that. Okay? And it could be generalized to other types of problems also. Any other question? If not, we should go for lunch because she was expecting us, I think, at 12.30. Yes. No, she told, yes, but she didn't know it. She was complaining with me that we were having coffee at 10 past 12. She was already putting the cauliflower there and thinking that we should be there at 12.30.